started and uh, make sure I've got the other program up and going so that everybody knows what date it is and we're already uh, streaming but uh, all right everybody guess what it is uh, Saturday April 25th 2020 and uh, well We've got some uh, interesting uh, things I wanted to bring up before we started uh, with Ed just doing his full-on thing, and he's got a guest that uh, is going to bring in some information, too. Uh, but uh, first things first, Ed, you were uh, telling Go ahead, me, go ahead. You got the floor right now. I know. You were telling me that you were getting frustrated at uh, a lot of these I, I am going, I'm just going to say a lot of these people that you call them, which we already know people is a fictitious uh, 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 name, basically, because anybody who says they're p part of the people or a person admits they're part of the corporation. But a lot of, you said a lot of these people you're getting frustrated and almost pissed off at because they are not paying attention or reading the 14th Amendment properly. They're only just glancing over it. They're not fully comprehending it. Mm -hmm. Is that right? You called me earlier. and That's a fact. And they haven't paid attention to the treaties. And then we got some other information we're going to be bringing in tonight, too. So, All right. Yeah, well, my, I've, my, I've got it. And the Indian treaties, I'll get into that. But go ahead. The floor is still yours. All right. My, my question on that is uh, if you're in a pit, I mean, a, a, a pit. Let, let's say you somehow fell down down a hole and you're about 10 feet down. And somebody lowers down a ladder to you. You use the ladder, right? You get out. But Yeah, I was more likely. I would use it. Try to get the hell out, wouldn't you? Right. Now, are you going to uh, jump back in and use the ladder over and over again? Or are you going to say, okay, I'm done with this. Let's pull the ladder up. Put the ladder away in, in case we need to use it again, and then get a hell away from that. Yeah, pit. try not to fall back in again. Absolutely. All right. Now, what I'm trying to say is very simply, you, everybody who's listening, unless you've already done the 14th, use the 14th Amendment as a tool, because yes, it is not ratified lawfully. It was ratified uh, corporately. A corporation mm -hmm. is what you're part of if you haven't made yourself a um, a free native a lawful bloodline native if you have not done the uh, instruments for that the affidavits and sending it off to even i mean i've done it and i don't have the funds to send it to the thousands of people that ed does every time he does anything uh, or putting it in the newspaper i sent it to the uh, secretary of state I sent it to a couple others through email, and that actually does work too because it has a uh, electronic date on every single email. They, you can't fake it. You can't change it. Uh, it's actual evidence, and you know that they've received it. Now, the thing is, mm -hmm. if you have not done that, you're in that pit. You are part of the corporate world where... All statute codes and administrative rules, you, you're you're part of, and so they can come in and take any of your firearms away. They can they can, they can take your children away. They can actually say, okay, well, you ate uh, bran muffins on the day that our uh, statute from back in 1820 said uh, that on Thursdays you can't eat any bran. Uh, you did. So we're going to send you to prison for uh, the full uh, 30 days. They can do that because you are still a indentured servant to them due to your birth certificate, due to your Social Security, thanks to Clinton, uh, and uh, due to you giving out your Social Security number and following like your, uh, like your um, driver's license and everything like that. You're in that pit. Ed is showing you that you're in that pit, but due to the corporate trying to appear like they're, uh, they, they want you to be free, they've already built that damn ladder. But a lot of 
a lot of you do not know that that ladder exists because it's pitch black in there. Some people, some are feeling around and they feel the ladder, but they're not sure how to use it properly. They don't know if all the rungs are up there and everything. The 14th Amendment is the ladder to get out of the pit. Once you're done with it, once you used it, because the, you're using a legal instrument to become lawful. Once you're lawful, that legal instrument does not matter anymore to you at all, unless you give yourself up and go back to the legal aspect of it. Is that about right to say on that, Ed? Oh, absolutely. And I even got that confirmed yesterday because I was on the candidate form. And I even got it confirmed by County Commissioner uh, Hall. And not only that, I brought up the structure that police and sheriff deputies and sheriff themselves are nonprofit agents. If the sheriff himself has no Ed. agency, then he has lawful authority. Ed. Go ahead. Um, when you're playing sports, do you give over your playbook to the, uh, to the opposite team or do you keep your playbook and give them, uh, some surprises? Well, yeah, that's the only way you're going to win. Right. So shut it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. Oh, you enjoyed that one. <laughs> Damn straight I did. Anyways. That's the part. That's part of it. Now, here's something I'm. That's uh, so. Anyone who's wanting is wondering why the Fourteenth Amendment is important. They made it to where the citizen, big C, little C crap. They actually made it to where if you comprehend it properly, which Ed has, and many others have, um, you can use it if you're fifth generation or more, born here on this soil, America. Uh, that that's the 48 states. Alaska and uh, Hawaii are corporate states. They are not actual part of the mm -hmm. organic America. Uh, you can get out using the 14th Amendment. Once you're out, you just need to focus on staying out. Now, this is part part of one of the reasons I brought this up. Now, this is just something for you for y'all to understand. Uh. Anytime I get a check that I cash at a bank, I always uh, write in all rights reserved. And I do it with a red ink pen because that signifies a living mm -hmm. man or woman. Um, thing is, Ed brought some other stuff that you, I need to write in. And once I can get it all put together, I'm going to. Uh, I put Now I'm going to start writing in on the check before I autograph it. You never sign. Signing is a uh, dead man's hand, basically. Autographing is living. Uh, all rights reserved. Lawful bloodline native. Under duress. I-207 and I-308. Now, I asked Ed a little bit on that. Uh, under duress. You're basically using their system under duress so you can keep on getting their fiat currency because we all know the only lawful currency is gold and silver. But I-207 and I-308 is item 207 and item 308. And in the future, on the website, once Ed can get it to me, I will get those uh, items in there so you know what they fully stand for. And, of course, you're claiming you're a lawful bloodline native once you went through the process. And all rights reserved means you're not giving up any rights by autographing that check and getting that uh, that toilet paper. I mean, that's basically how much the uh, money is worth now, the, the fiat currency. Mm -hmm. But the reason I'm saying that is with this stimulus bill, or this uh, bailout checks, everything, what, what you might be getting because you've uh, given your social to uh, the IRS or you filled out their nice little uh, instruments, which... That might be a big uh, uh, kerfuffle right there because you gave them a lot of information. You're basically get jumping back into the system. you got to watch out for that. They, they'll they claim that they're helping you when, in fact, like with this, if you're a lawful bloodline native, you accept this without writing extra stuff in on the uh, checks or 
making an affidavit or some type of instrument that's claiming you're keeping your lawful bloodline status, but you're accepting this gift from the corporate world, they're basically buying you to go back to indentured servitude. I mean, just think about that. Seriously thinking about that. I've been thinking about it, and I realize this is actually a really smart, sneaky plan that a lot of them do. Another smart, sneaky plan that I came up with is this, uh, uh, as one put it, unwanted import from China uh, that everybody's uh, sheltering in place kind of thing. Think about it. It's smart. Everybody is having financial issues, right? China has trillions upon trillions of American currency. I mean, they've been... They've even been buying out all the gold from us, too. So, not now, only that, they don't legally have a right, but they've been buying land. Go yep, ahead. They've been buying land. I mean, one of the reasons why the Bundys was uh, fighting so hard over in Nevada is that part of that land that they were trying to get do with the turtle thing was actually going to end up being a solar pa uh, power plant from China. China was going to own that soil they were going to do that in utah too well they've already done quite a bit in a lot of states i mean there's even mm -hmm. supposedly a hunting reserve for rich japanese over in oregon in an oregon forest yeah there so, is in eastern oregon i know for a fact because i was shocked when they were moving in and doing that 20 years ago and 25 years ago and not only that they were going out and Catching deer and elk and flying them back into the caged area because they put up a 15 foot barbed wire fence around the area. Right. So and and I do know that for a fact because I witnessed it. All right. So there's that aspect. But if you think about it, long term, just long term here, and I'll be giving this over to Ed very shortly, but. Think about this. With this unwanted import, everybody's separated out. Everybody's having uh, financial issues. They don't know if they're going to get food. Uh, a lot of small businesses are being uh, are, are folding, even with this uh, helping uh, hand from the, uh, from the federal side of the government, which they're taking money from you, giving money to you. That's pretty much what it is. Here's the thing. The other countries are already starting to catch on to this. And uh, they're actually starting to block uh, China from coming in and buying big shares in helping companies that they want, like infrastructure, like electricity, um, manufacturing, stuff like that. China's got all this money. They can invest in all the other countries, including America, and get controlling stocks so uh, technically – they will invade through finances, and they've already been doing that here in America like crazy. We need to do just stop the imports from China completely. Make everything here in America. If we can't make it, find somebody else who we can work with. But China... Well, is... we don't need it. Oh, come on, Ed. Do you realize the dumb phones? Oh, we got to stop with all the greed. Ed, a lot of these... Um, Youngins cannot live without their dumb phones. So that that's what I'm saying is that a lot of that a lot of the uh, um, the dumb phones, uh, smartphones people call them or smart TVs, a lot of the screens, I don't know I don't have one. The screens actually are from very rare earth elements that are mainly found in China, and they're found also in gold mines, but it's very hard to process them. And China's taken that over because they've got basically um, a dispensable working force. They don't care what happens to the uh, the people of China. They only care whether they've got power or not. So with that, think about it. Anytime you buy something from China in the future, technically, if you look at it properly, you're a traitor. Ed, why don't you take it away? Cool, thank you. I'd like to thank everybody for joining. I got a good friend of mine that's going to join us here in a few. We're bringing up two sides because we're putting the pieces together in this puzzle. And when you think about what's really going on compared to what 
people are tend to believe. Let's just put it that way. Yesterday, I did a county uh, commission meeting with, uh, but not a county commission meeting. I mean, a public uh, gathering with the city of Newport, and we were doing a candidates forum because I'm running for county commissioner of Lincoln County. And so it was very interesting because we got into about growing food and doing all that. And, you know, you have to grow your food, catch your rainwater. You know, it's like people will say, oh, you can't collect rainwater. That's a crime. No, it's not. I don't give a shit what Kate Brown says. When uh, Kulangoski and they try to pass the bill, I'm the one who got the bill killed, and they put it administratively. Okay, because you got to remember, Oregon State and your state is a corporation. And so they don't have rights to dictate to you. And see, this is the point. When he's bringing it up, because I filed, when I filed my rights, I freaked out people. How can you do that? Of course, I don't get messed with anymore. I mean, the cops are going to chew me out. They try to come up with bullshit on me, but it doesn't work because I filed it, and they're, like, freaking out. And they're going, how do you know this? How do you know that? Well, I do my research, and that's what we're going to get in tonight because a friend of mine brought up a good point to me today, and I knew part of the point, but he put the rest of the ball together for me. And then I'm going to put some other ball together before I bring him on because I'm going to just let him go for it. But I want you guys to comprehend dealing with what he was talking about, dealing with public right-of-ways, all right, in public office. Because, see, when I go into public, see, this is one thing. When I filed for running for county commissioner, and I'll, I'll get it, i play that, and I've got to download that and get it up. But when I filed for county commissioner, I got a call going, well, you're not a registered voter. And they said, I know, I rescinded all my contracts, and I don't have to be a participant in it. Oh, well, if you're running for office, you have to be a voter. And I said, no, that is not true. I'm not in office, so I don't have to give up my rights under Title Eight. So that's the one thing that gets to me about it is, and, and that's, quest, excuse me, that's even questionable because I'm Native. I'm not a corporation member. You know, I mean, my family's been on this soil going back to the 1700s. So it, it, you step out of the movie and you watch the production. You put these pieces together. And then, you know, because, I mean, I have my side, and I do know how to write the criminal charges, and that's the one thing when you get your kids taken or whatever. You have to write these criminal charges. If you don't put the structure in, and I'm going to explain this to you, 1 U.S. Code 8, persons, human, being, child, individual, including a born live child, Okay. You've got to read this stuff to comprehend it's a corporation. And so when you give up your rights, and I saw at the state of Oregon, when you register your child, you're giving it over to the state, and they register it, and the state attorney general's office files it, and then they're claiming it as a vessel. But then our guest has got another side that really, really is going to shock people. And so I want to make sure he gets that out. And this is the other point I want to bring into this point. Because I got a couple of other points before I turn over the floor to this gentleman. And I want you to comprehend 18 U.S.C. Code 1590, trafficking with the respect to personage, slavery, and voluntary servitude and forced labor. And he's going to get into that part on part of the structure he's bringing up because this code walks right into that. So when you're writing the criminal codes, he's got a hell of a point to bring in. And so when you're putting your your uh, your legal documents to be lawful, even if you're an immigrant, that's a legal document. It still has to be done a certain way, and you have to understand that if you're an immigrant, you know, you're still on Indian soil. I did find the uh, congressional acts and that, that the Indian treaties are technically the law of the entire 48 states by Congress and by the state Supreme Court in writing. And so I can produce that, and we'll have that up on the website sometime this week. But I want to, you know, we're, we're getting this. We're putting these things together. We're, we're, we're taking our time because it does take time putting this together. And then with our guest, when he's bringing this other side in, and it's going to floor people because he's got an interesting point of view that's going to shock you. And then we'll get into that a little and ask some questions, or, you know, I'll even let him go ahead. He can answer the questions. But this is the one thing that, you know, I mean, I have, I have a lot of respect on this guy because we've argued over a lot of things over time. 
you know, and, you know, there's been times when I was right, there's times when I was wrong. And yeah, I have to admit to that. And so, and it gets into when he was talking about the sheriff, and I can bring that up, and I got to get the tape from the deal. Hopefully they don't tamper with it. But yesterday when I was doing the forum with the uh, county commissioners, candidates, because there's four of us running for a position, the other three are all public employees, well, figures. And so they're all public employees, you know, trying to save their contracts, their job to keep the feed money going. You got to remember, this is a trough. So, and he's going to get into part of that trough. See, it's all a trough. So when you step out of the movie and you watch this production, that's why when it comes to your court case stuff, I always recommend you watch Interstate 40 or Interstate 60. I mean, Interstate 60 first. You know, always watch it because, I mean, see, this is the one thing that we're going through in Oregon, you know, is that, you know, they got everything closed down. They're doing all this to shut the businesses down because the whole main point was they had shut down the state because the governor went and met with the foreigners over in China and Asia. And so they want to be able to set this country over there and take away Americans. And she's not even American. She's from Spain unfortunately. And so that's the one thing about Kate Brown, you know, to me, she's a terrorist. She's a domestic terrorist. She's from Spain. And not only that, she's a lawyer. And by law, she can't even be in the circumstances to be an employee. See, this is the one thing. And I, and I bring up the employee laws and you go on it and that's title five. And I got some other structures, and then, you know, the, the guest, he brought up some other points. And so when we started putting all this together and I started sitting down, I really focused on putting these writings down. We'll bat it around. You'll be amazed when it all starts coming together because putting these pieces together and the way the cross reference of this comes in and that comes in and you put them together, it's putting the pieces together of this puzzle so you get to know what the future is. And that's the craziest part right now. And also, too, with the coronavirus, we do have the deal. They did have vaccinations. They were doing that with the animals 20 years ago. I've got the MSD sheets. I've got the data. I've done the research. i got more I'm doing on it. I just got another associate that just sent me some more facts on it that did other research, and we know where the patents is, who owns the patents, and that. So getting this stuff out, you know, we want to get it out, but we know that with uh, Facebook, they're going with us and sometimes having conflicts because it's very disturbing with them, even though I like Facebook because that's how we're all getting communications. That's where we got a lot of our education around, bouncing around and how we're working with this. So we got to look at things and work with what we can. But, of course, I will never trust anybody in Bill Gates' association and then uh, after we get done, I want to tap into the immigration employee opportunities and criminal behavior. But also, too, my guest is going to be tagging into that. So when you're ready to bring them in, let me know, and we're going to turn the floor over to them. And uh, I'll All let right. him introduce himself. Cause are you here now? Oh, he's been here. He's been waiting. I just, uh, yeah. All right, so everybody... Uh, Oh, here, quick question. A uh, guest number one. Do you mind if I call you by uh, the name that I've got you written on here for? Hello? Yeah. Do you Southern, mind? come on in. All right, here's here. Southern. Okay. Uh, I know you didn't get a chance to read that whole document I gave you. Oh, no. I had to, I've got a lot of stuff, but go ahead. The floor is yours. Okay. Ed's going to give you a document. Read it carefully. All right? Uh, you said a minute ago that we're vessels. We're not vessels. All right? You've got to go get the immigration naturalization, people. <clears throat> Every child since 1940, under the National Nationality Act of 1940, uh, is a foundling child. He is only presumed to be a citizen of the United States. Nobody is holding anything that is that actually says they are a citizen, unless you came from a foreign country. Now, in that document that he's got, I pulled out 
the Constitution annotated Article One, Legislative Department, Powers of Congress. And it clearly tells you in there about naturalization of citizenship. All right? This is, this is the Constitution annotated. This is how it's interpreted. All right? And it's got the case laws of the Supreme Court and everything in there. Okay? A person born in this country cannot be made a citizen. All right? They can't do that. Power of Congress only allows them to make citizens of foreign people in foreign countries. All right? It, that is classified by the Supreme Court as the act of adopting a foreigner and clothing him with the privileges right, of a native citizen. Now, the problem is a native citizen. I can't find anything in the law, immigration naturalization, that creates a native citizen. Nothing. If I missed it, somebody find it for me. Because I read it I've all. I've got it. Most... What? I said I have that, and that's by the Supreme Court with the Indian Nation. Certain Indian tribes, yes. Okay? But nobody else. That's Correct. why you got you got to read what I, I sent you. There's a few Indian tribes, yes. But there's terms and conditions to that. All right? Now, when children are born in this country, they're presumed abandoned at birth. All right? That way, the state took the certificate of live birth. Um, there's something I can't put on this document yet because I still got to do some research into it. They created, generated what's called a birth certificate. Uh, now, uh, under the Immigration Naturalization Act, hold on, let me find this here. Let me find it. All right, there's two things you need to look up. One is 8 U.S.C. 1183. And the other one is 8 U.S.C. 1363. Both of them talk about a bond, an immigration bond. Now, if you read the first one very carefully, all right, 1183, it talks about somebody becoming a public charge. Well, when your children go to school, all right, they have to hand over a birth certificate. This is how they get paid. The same thing happens when you go to jail. When you're arrested, <clears throat> they take that bond, that, they get a copy of your birth certificate, scribble some stuff on the back, pay to the order of whoever, and they take it down, they cash it in at the comptroller's office, and they get paid. This is how they're keeping people in jail uh, and making $60,000 a year to keep someone in jail when the average family out here doesn't make but about forty thousand, forty-five thousand, California is eighty thousand dollars a year. I don't know what it is in Oregon, but I do know in California it's eighty thousand dollars a year. Yeah, it's anywhere from fifty to eighty here. Yeah, well, that's a lot of damn money, considering what, considering all you're doing is basically putting clothes on somebody uh, and giving them three meals a day and security. This, this whole thing, we've got to understand what's going on here. All right. In uh, 19, hold on, when I'm there. I guess I've got to find it all. Now, hold on one second. Let me get back up here. They did this, and what they're doing is turning you, the state is making you a national, all right, and assuming that you are a citizen, all right. <clears throat> In 1989, United Nations Convention on Rights of a Child, Article 7, Name and Nationality, 
the child shall be registered immediately after birth. Now, understand something before I go with this. We've been doing this in this country since 1910. Hmm. Actually, in 19, oh, before that. Okay? Registering children. The child shall be registered immediately after birth and shall have the right from birth uh, to a name and the right to acquire a nationality. And as far as possible, the right to know uh, and be cared for by his or her parents. All right? What they're doing is they're taking you, uh, assuming that you're a citizen, a child, all right, and they're handing you back over to your parents. All right? Except now those parents are adopted. They're, they're foster parents. I pulled up the law in Florida on foster parenting. That really blows it away. Didn't I, Ed? Go ahead. Okay. What they did in, 19, in 1940 was they created bastard, a bunch of bastard children, dominating children. Now, I've been working down here in Florida on this right, for some time now. Okay? Um, now, Ed thinks that you can claim a child. Right. I've you done cannot it. Claim, you cannot claim that child. All right? <clears throat> There's a thing called an order of felicitation in there. Hold on a second. That's order of F-I-L-I-A-T-I-O-N. What an order of felicitation is, is you get two judges to decree that you are the father of that child. We have tried many times to get this done with many people, and they will not do it. They absolutely refuse. What they're doing in these courts are adjudicating you the father of a child or suckering you into admitting that you're the father. That way they don't have to adjudicate you. I mean, they don't have to decree you the father. Once that decree is done, they have to hand that birth certificate over to you. Because now the child has a legitimate father, right? And he's over that child. Now, what they're doing is pulling a trick on everybody. They're giving you... Wait one second. Hold on. They're giving you fathers who are walking into these courtrooms... Right, to admit that this kid is yours. But when they do this, they're, they're pulling a, a scam on you. Um, hold on, where in the hell is it? I'm going to have to bear with me here just a second. Okay. Well, he gets that. Because, I mean, I get into it because we, we got both sides of the coin putting together. And see, I know I've done it where I've been able to prove ownership of a child by filing a paper, and the judge has certified that. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Go ahead. You know, we've been through this. They, what they're doing is putting you on that punitive father registry. Mm -hmm. Okay? They're not saying you're the father. They're not giving you a decree. Okay? They're putting you on that P-U-T-A-T. I-V-E registry. And that means reputed to be that which is not. Okay? Now, when these people refuse to give you this order of felicitation, right? This is a decree. We have not been able to do that. They will not give it to us. Second here, I'm looking for something real interesting. I'm going to think up. Okay, come on, please. You know, he's getting that because see, that's the one thing we have a little conflict because I know for a fact of Oregon State administrative rules when you register your child with the state, you give it over to the lawyers or firm, and it says it right in them state administrative rules. Well, yes, you're right. You're right about that. Yeah, you know, and so when you do that, that's why 
when you do that, and when we've been successful, and I have done this where, you know, apparently that, you know, we, we got away with it, or they're just not arguing and, and screwing with us because they didn't want us to go further, I presume, is what, you know, what we're, we're sharing the differences here to combine. Well, and that's what not, I say. Go ahead. They don't want this cat out of the bag. We know they that. They don't. Okay, they're hiding this order up, this order of facilitation. Okay, from everybody. Bouvier's 1856 Dictionary is real interesting. All right? Order of Felicitation, a name of a judgment tendered by, listen carefully, two judges. All right? Having jurisdiction in such cases in which the man therein named is adjudicated to be the putative father of a bastard child. And it is for further adjudicated that he will pay a sum for its support. Do you understand what I just said? He is just repeat it again. Huh? Repeat it. The name, order of felicitation, the name of a judgment tendered by two justices. That means it's got to have be signed by two judges. Having jurisdiction in such case, in which the man therein named is adjudicated to be the, fa- the putative father of a bastard child. And it is further adjudicated that he pay a sum, certain sum for his support. Okay? The problem there is that you're back to that punitive father, alleged to be that it's not. They don't want this coming out. Believe me, they don't. I've been fighting this. I've actually had people threaten to get arrested and everything else because we want a decree from these judges, all right, that this is my child. They won't give it. An adjudication is not a decree. The side step in this because now the state is not local parentis anymore to that child. I, and they get to use a birth certificate when he becomes a public. It's all about this birth certificate and becoming a public charge. All right, all about that's all it's about. Um, U.S. legal is a good one. An order of solicitation is an official document declaring a man to be the father of a child. Once the order is made, the father has an obligation to support to support the child and may have rights regarding custody and visitation. Laws governing order of felicitation vary by state. So local laws should be should be uh, consulted. Again, why can't we get this order of felicitation? They won't give it to you. <clears throat> It's all about being able to use that birth certificate. Now, we have done some research, some work here with signing some things on the back of a birth certificate and putting down some stuff and giving it to schools where the schools have literally turned around and said, okay, whatever you want us to do, that's it. But, again, we're back to the same thing. All right? They will not give out that order of felicitation. They're going crazy with it. Any questions, Mr. Ed? No, yeah. Well, we got to come up with a solution to this one, too, because we're going to put this up. I'll get this posted up on the website so people can get it. But see, the whole thing is coming up to solutions now. Yes, like I said, when I was doing a talk show yesterday, I did get the uh, oh the county commissioner to admit that the sheriff's deputies and sheriff, his duty is 100% in the courtroom. They're not supposed to be on the street at all, as he said. Well, I know that. But that's why that. he's got it. We've got proof. And so when he said that, that was the kicker because when I brought up the structure, when I, well, when I was speaking, how sheriff and police officers are private contractors. 
Mm-hmm. I know. I used to be a rent cop. That's all they are is a policy officer. So and there's nothing more to them. You know, and it even says it, like I said, there's a good line in uh, the movie um, Blazing Saddles on it with the Black Sheriff. You know, when I heard that way back when, when I saw the movie, it was like, well, that just opened up my eyes. Just that one paragraph in that movie really hit me. So when he said that, and this is true, they don't have authority. And I do have the, the Supreme Court decisions that a sheriff has no authority to be outside of a court. And I have those Supreme Court cases, and the last one was done in uh, New Jersey, and that was just done eight years ago. Well, do me a favor, send me those. Oh yeah, I will definitely do that. Absolutely. Because this is the and I, I did not didn't I send you the sheriff's handbook too? No. Oh, I'll get that to you here in a few. You see, we got the sheriff's handbook up too, and it's just, and I do have the martial law, uh, the the federal marshal's handbook too. Because you know, and this is the one thing: stepping out, reading this stuff, putting these pieces together, you know. And before you get out there, because I've been talking about putting together, because uh, uh, some states are now talking about if you're going to go out and petition, you're going to be arrested because you're not supposed to be petitioning. California is a big one that's passing that right now, that if you're out petitioning on the street, mandatory 30 days in jail. And see, this is the one thing, of course, the California governor is Nancy Pelosi's nephew. Well, you Go also ahead. got to remember something, all right? The police power is in the state. Right. But I don't in live in the government. state. Go ahead. Now, the police power is in the state government, okay? I, ju- I just got through arguing that out with somebody, and I'm not going to go there. But, no, bring but it out got- for others, because we, we can argue, too. I don't have an issue with it, because people need to know both sides in, in the circumstances. So bring it up. Well, there's a bunch. If you, if you look up police power on Google Police Power PDF, you're going to pull up about two or 300 documents that tell you specifically that the police power is lies in the state. All right? Mm-hmm. State of Oregon, state of California, and their, ju- ju- and their geographical jurisdiction. And uh, this all started under Jacobson versus Massachusetts and another case law. I can't think of what it is right now. But Jacobson versus Massachusetts is a good one. They, the judges created a police state, okay? Like they, people think they want common law. Let me tell you something. Common law is judge-made rulings from the bench that become law. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody wants to say common law, and I'm like, I don't want common law. Go ahead. No, you you do not want common law. We we are not a common law country. We are a constitutional law country. Was supposed to be under the Constitution. All right? The Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Seventh Amendment. Uh, I won't even argue with people who want common law. I, I won't because it's it's waste of time. The point. I'm too old. I got a bad heart. Now I found, just found out that I got type two diabetes, so I ain't, I'm not doing it no more. And we'll let people believe whatever the fantasy they want to believe. But if you read the Constitution, uh, when we came to this country, I, back a thousand years ago, 1100s, some mid 1100s, they created something called the Odyssey of Clarodyne. Now, in the 1100s, you have to understand what was going on. And that we, they were in the middle of what they called the Inquisitions where somebody could point the finger at you and then they simply took you into a jail and tortured a confession out of you. Uh, and then they burned you at the stake or hung you or whatever. <clears throat> the Odyssey of Clarendon created the grand jury. Um, I recently sat down with some lawyers about five or six months ago and we went through this and the Constitution and they couldn't believe it. They never heard of the Odyssey of Clarendon. Now, 
the Magna Carta created the, the pellet jury. Mm-hmm. The, the government agents are not supposed to point the finger at anybody. Right? The only person, the group of people that has a lawful right to investigate a crime is a grand jury. Mm-hmm. This took the power away from the government. It took the power away from the Pope. It took the power away from everybody and handed it to the people. Um, if you, Like I said, if you read the Constitution, nothing in the Constitution says trial by judge. I've not found it, okay? But I've read 46 on a page um, Constitution annotated. There's nothing in there that says trial by you will have a trial by judge. No, it says trial by jury. All right? It's that simple. <clears throat> uh, when we got to the United States, we didn't want, we were, our ancestors remembered what happened in the Inquisitions. Mm-hmm. And there's some very good movies out there on, on YouTube about the, the Inquisitions. You might want to go look them up. Uh, Thousand, almost a thousand years of, of people getting six hundred, getting tortured and murdered right, for being a heretic, not uh, not falling in line with the Catholic Catholic Church. The Pope, the Pope ordained it, and his mercenary soldiers carried it out. And we're not supposed to have that kind of a government in this country. It's supposed to be a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And any any trial <clears throat> or anybody pointing the finger at you, a cop, a prosecuting attorney, it don't matter. This is why you're always trying the name of the state, because he's acting in the name of the people with their alleged authority. Now, one trick that I've done and got, and got away with was I asked him who was the, the injured party. The state was. I said, who are the state? The people of the state. I turned around and, and faced everybody in the courtroom. I said, with the injured party, the state, please step forward. Nobody stepped forward. The judge had a heart attack. Mm-hmm. He knew what I just did. I said, John, there's nobody, there's no injured party here. Okay? The answer is the state was injured. I want to know how. And then the guy said, well, the statue was injured. I said, the statue is a copyrighted piece of garbage. I said, I don't want, I don't want to hear that. The statue is injured. How can I injure somebody's copyrighted material? Did I plagiarize it? Did I copy copyrighted print it? What did I do? Okay? And they didn't know what to say to that. They they went dead silent. All right? They didn't look happy, but they went dead silent. And the and see, I gotta I gotta bring that in. I've done the same thing. Well, I filed instrument to the deal and asked them to prove that they own the child because how they're doing it, when you register your child with the state, they claim it as abandoned vessel by their administrative rules. Go ahead. Well, they can claim whatever they want, okay? But the, the bottom line is, if you have a... Now, I don't know how true this is. I... I got this information secondhand from somebody. But when you fill out a certificate of live birth, it goes to uh, Bureau of Vital Statistics, and Mm -hmm. they use that information to generate an abandoned child document. And that all goes into a file. And they tag it as abandoned. All right? And then they generate a birth certificate off of that. Like I said, I got that second hand. I can't prove that, but I do know that there's that a founding child is supposed to be tagged as such. Now, up until about 1950s, believe it or not, there there was three words with check boxes on it: legitimate, illegitimate, and founding. Mm-hmm. And I do know people who went back and got not their birth certificate because they're not old enough, I, but they got their mother's and father's birth certificate. And found out the founding box. So they took that off there. 
around 1950s, early 50s, yep. because it, it said it was bad for the children to, to know that they were founding. What they did was hid this stuff from everybody, okay? Because they they can't just make somebody a citizen. Contrary to what they're telling you, we still are free people. That's why they, if you read the first immigration and naturalization laws, all right, in 1790, it tells you that everybody was supposed to go down to the courthouse, swear allegiance to the United States government, and get their documents that they were mm-hmm. citizens of the United States. Well, if you happen to be somebody at the time living in back with Virginia or Tennessee or some Ohio Valley, your chance of finding this or hearing about this is more than that. So a lot of people didn't do it. And it's remained that way even up until today. I mean, seriously, how many people at age 18 have gone down to the courthouse and went through immigration naturalization? I don't know of anybody that's done it. Now, that's a major fact. Nobody gets it because nobody's told this stuff. It's like when they give you a Social Security card. You don't have to have one. You can turn it down. But your parents do it. Your parents walk in and give it to you. Well, they want everybody to have a Social Security card. That's money in their pocket. Oh, uh, no, I comprehend uh, that one. Now, the main thing here... You gotta you gotta understand what they did. Uh, hold on one second. Let me find it. While you're this finding is- that, you see what I personally gone through. This is one thing that I did. Is see when I filed that I owned myself and separated myself from the state and the system and all that, which I did. And see the the interesting part about all that. After I did that, my house was robbed. My birth certificate, all my stuff from my Court files, everything was robbed by the Toledo Police Department and the Sheriff's Department. And then after I deregulated myself, I had some nonprofit deals until I knew better. And then after I deregulated myself, I got letters from the state secretary of state that says, you cannot be affiliated or be part of a nonprofit seeing that you're not a corporation. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something. Hold on just a minute. Go ahead. Hold on. So, but see, this is the point of putting these things together because there's, there's some of us that have conflicts of interest in this stuff, and we know that for a fact. And then we have that, so we're putting these things together, and we know what's going on. I mean, because, see, I mean, I went ahead and filed, let me know when you're ready, I went ahead and filed paperwork that shocked people, you know, claiming myself doing this, doing that, and, you know, even when I filed on the sheriff's department, I filed on, and you go to New Dodge, Oregon Trackers, and you can see I filed on each and every sheriff in the state of Oregon and their corporation. And remember, they're not honoring their constitutional oath at all. They're running rogue. Where That's they what, got, go ahead. They snuck, in, they snuck one in on you, Ed. Um, I'll have to get the case law to you. Okay. Uh, slavery is outlawed. They snuck one in on you mm-hmm. in the 14th Amendment, except for military service. Right. This is why they got everybody in the militia. Okay? Uh, like I said, I'll get that case law to you. Okay, and then let me jump in here. 5 U.S.C. 7311. You know, when they're violating their oath of servitude, and this is Executive Order 10450, punishment by prison, capital offense, or fines. Go ahead. Yep, I understand that. But like I said, what these people are doing is they're running military courts, military governments. And I do have that confirmed. We've had that confirmed uh, by the Oregon State military itself. Go ahead. Okay. 
uh, you, you, uh, I want you to watch what uh, your county commissioners, your city hall, everywhere you go, you're going to find two flags. This was, it, I've been working on this flag stuff for a long time. You know it. Oh, yeah. Right? There are two flags flying in that courtroom. A long time ago, somebody told somebody, that told me that you're under the wrong flag. Everybody thinks you're under that gold-fed United States military flag with an eagle on top. You're not. You're under that state flag. All right, this was just confirmed to me a few months back. All right, which I conned the person, okay, to get that information. But as long as you're under that state flag, all right. You have no constitutional rights because you're presumed to be the state militia, which they have jurisdiction over. Hence the all capital name. Now, according to 6 CFR 37.3, all right, the definition of, of a name is an individual's first, first name, middle name, and last name or surname without use of middle initials or nicknames. These people that are calling themselves John F. Joe, Doe, okay, and signing that stuff this way, they're not using the proper names. All right? Now, two things you got to understand. It's called the Doctrine of Edom Sonus. E D, I mean I D E M S O N A N S. Okay, this is, I've got something in this document about that. What that is, is a name that sounds the same, but is spelled differently. Okay. Well, I broke the thing with me uh, about a year ago. I think it was about a year ago, a year around that area, a little over. A gentleman I know was sitting someplace one day watching a video. And he called me on the phone and said, you got to watch this video. So he sent it to me. And I said, okay, I'm looking at it for a few minutes. And I said, this, this stupid that face movie and that garbage. He said, wait till you get the last 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes of movie. So, okay, I'm watching the whole movie. I'm sitting here about half asleep. You know how it is. And you're bored. And then all of a sudden, this guy made a statement. The statement was, to name something is to show dominance over it. Mm -hmm. This is a maximum law. They named you, so therefore, they show dominance over you by naming you. Anybody remember the movie Ruth, where they whipped Kuzik and Teddy to take his name clothing? Same thing. Where do they get this from? You ain't going to believe it. The Bible. Go <laughs> read Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Mm -hmm. All right? God made the animals. What did he do with the animals? He sent the animals to Adam so that Adam could name them and have dominance over them. This is where you're getting that all capital name from, people. Don't let nobody change the corporation or any of that, because it doesn't have LLC, corporate CEO behind it, or any of this stuff. They literally renamed you. Now, when they did this, all right, this is why they, when you got to go into the, uh, Um, hold on a second. You got to go to the United Nations again. All right? A person has a right to a nationality and a name. They gave you a nationality and they gave you a name because you are a founding child. Mm -hmm. in, order, in order for you, okay, you have to own that name. Not the uppercase one, the lowercase. You've got to own that name. You've got to get a decree to you that you are the owner. All right? You've got to register that as property. This is the only way that you're going to separate yourself from this system. All right? As to long own as your property. Yes, that's a fact. Go ahead. Okay. Now, years ago, I threw a document in. I sent it to the Department of Military. I sent it to the President. 
I, I sent it to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Quantico, Virginia, Judge Advocate General's Office, and the Governor, declaring the fact that I was not a member of the state militia. I, think, I could never figure out why that document didn't work, but it didn't. Now I know why. It's all in the name. It's all in the nationalization. It's all in the immigration. Everything that they're doing to you is in, in there. All right. Any questions? No, we haven't got to that point. We'll get the floor open here at a point. We're going to dictate a little bit more here. I love using that word sometimes. But yeah. see, this is the one thing that is walking through this, bringing both sides of these coins together, and looking how it works, because it's like an ice cream sandwich, you know? You enjoy the middle until you know how rough it can be. Well, I can tell you right now that bringing some of this stuff up in court down here has gotten reactions like you ain't there. Mount St. Helens and Mount Vesuvius, all right, and Hiroshima and Nagasaki was at night. I now, so we, we, yeah, we've done it up here, and all we do is get the case thrown out, and then the case was never heard. There was no file of the case. And then you don't get in, you don't see them. They just don't want nothing to do with you because they're afraid what you're going to bring back next. Well, when I started putting the DC code in. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Please, let's get into that one. Before we <laughs> open up the floor, I want to get into the DC code a little bit. Go ahead. The DC code is, is not worded crazy like some of these statutes are, right? One of the DC codes you want to look up, and I got it in here, is 7 206 Infants of Unknown Parentage. Mm -hmm. This law exists in every single state. Okay? Now, it basically. Let, 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 repeat that. Repeat that again. It's District of Columbia Code 7 dash, not dot, dash, 206 Infants of Unknown Parentage. Remember, there's an informant on that birth certificate. They are informing on who the parents were, mm -hmm. okay, because the parents ran away and abandoned the child. Now, this is like I said, this on this document, but the interesting one, have you ever heard of parent locator registry? Yeah. Okay. DC code 7-205.01. Social Security Numbers, a person required to prepare and file a certificate of birth shall provide on a form separate from the certificate of birth the Social Security account number or numbers. You have up to 10 number accounts, by the way. Yeah. If the parent has more than one Social Security account number, the Social Security account numbers shall be recorded on the shall not be recorded on the certificate of birth. B, the Social Security account number shall be collected by the register and made available only to the Title IV D agency for the establishment, modification, and enforcement of support orders. A Social Security account number shall not be available to any other purpose. People, what well, you're not understanding, and I've been, been through this with some women, who we'll argued this out with me. They're putting mommy and daddy by on that parent locator registry because you abandoned that child. Okay? Now, if you've got any questions about this, about them naming you, go to 5 U.S.C. 552A, records maintained on individuals. Mm-hmm. The term individual means a citizen of the United States or an alien lawfully admitted for permanent residence. Um, hold on. Yeah, and I just want to clarify. I've never claimed to be a citizen. They try to put well, me in their system, but I am not a citizen. Well, there's you got to understand there's two systems, and you got to get out of both of them. One is the Right. One is, you, let me explain this. You cannot be a stateless person. You can't be a stateless person. Okay? 
people are not reading that 14th Amendment. There's two things in there that has to be. One is a citizen of the United States, and the other one is subject to the jurisdiction thereof. You can be a citizen of the United States, but you don't have to be subject to their jurisdiction. You follow me? They have to have both. Mm -hmm. Now, I have read the Constitution and I said, like I said, all 46, 4700 pages of it. The only place I can find their jurisdiction, Article 1, Section 8, over the militia. I can't find anything else. I brought this up to several lawyers uh, and challenged them to find the jurisdiction of the United States over me. They can't find it either. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, hold on. Let me get back here. Okay. The term record maintained, maintained, Oh, the, the term record means any item, collection, or group of information, listen carefully, about an individual. Now, they're talk, talking to a, per, a person. They're talking to a human being, me and you. <clears throat> okay? you got to use, see everybody runs the black wall. you got to use their definition. What? They, their dictums. Okay? That is maintained by an agency, including but not limited to, is educational, financial transactions, medical history, and criminal employment history. And that contain his name or other identifying numbers, symbols. What they're talking about there is your, your social security number. Okay? Or other identifying particular, listen carefully, assigned to the individual, such as a finger or voice print, or a photograph. So basically, they assigned you your fingerprints, your voice print, and that picture of you that's on that damn driver's license. It was assigned to you. Okay? Which they, I uh, don't have. Huh? <laughs> I, said, I don't term, have one. Yeah, well, the term system of records means a group of any record under the control of any agency from which information is retained by the, by the name of the individual or by some identifying number or symbol, there we go again, or other identifying particulars assigned to the individual. Mm -hmm. Or there's, person. There's your, name, there's your all capital name in a nutshell, people. They gave you a name and they gave you a nationality. Now, under, under Congress, all right, Constitution annotated, Article 1, Legislative Department, page 301, Section 8, Powers of Congress, Clause 4, the Congress shall have power to establish uniform rules of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcy throughout the United States. Listen carefully to establish uniform rules of naturalization. They cannot make you a citizen of this country. This is all a presumption. Yeah, you you're going to send that to me so we can put that up. I did send it to you. Oh, is that, oh, you're reading that right now then, huh? Yes, I'm reading it, yes. Oh, okay, got all it. Right. I've got it. We'll get it posted up. Duh. Okay. Nature and scope of Congress's power, power naturalization has been defined by the Supreme Court as the act of adopting a foreigner and closing him with mm -hmm. the privilege of a native citizen. Now, now get that that. back to that part where it goes the paragraph before the two paragraphs before the native citizen part. What do you mean? Reread that that you just read. The nature and scope of Congress's power of naturalization has been defined by the United States Court as the act of adopting a foreigner and clothing him with the privileges of a native citizen. That the United States versus Sioux Nation. 
448 U.S. 371, 1980. Mm -hmm. Also see Solomon versus Barlett, 1984. There must be substantial and, and compelling evidence of Congress's intention to dismiss Indian lands before the court will hold that a statute remove lands from the reservation. Nebraska versus Parker. Uh, I'm, I'm going with this, but I'm not. The, the bottom line, what you got here is these Indians are a conquered nation. All right? That's why we have treaties with them. They're sovereign. Two things do not, and this is a warning to everybody in the United States. Under international law, two things under a war does not transfer to the conqueror. Anybody want to tell me what that is, Ed? Say that again. Under international laws of war, two things do not transfer to the con to the conqueror. You want to tell me what that is? Oh, that's basically that's any treaty in native land. No. The sovereignty of the people does not transfer. All right, and the title to the land doesn't transfer. Yeah, why well, don't you solve it? The that, nation only becomes only becomes the controller of that, and mm -hmm. that's where people got to understand why they protect our lands and fishing and everything else. And once you have a fishing license, because the government is acting. Um, oh shoot, I can't think of the name of it now. All right, they they they're responsible to maintain that. Okay. There's a, there's a word for it. I'm, I'm like I said, I'm getting old here for this. No, but anyway, I want to bring up another point that I'm doing. Been doing. I did the research on it, but I haven't put put all the pieces together. But seeing that the state, when you register your cover, well, I call it cover wagon, but your vehicle with the state, and seeing that you register and the state owns it. Now there is a form through each and every state that I've seen and I read. That seeing that the state owns the vehicle, they're liable for the maintenance of that vehicle. Well, wait a minute. Let me explain something to you. All right? You're not registering the vehicle to the state. All right? This just got brought up down here about a year ago. You're registering the ownership to the state. You own the vehicle, okay? It's but the, it's registered to the state. There's a name for it. I got to look the damn document up. I found it. All right? You're not actually giving it to the state. You're just registering the ownership of the property. So if, that is the, if there's ever a question about ownership, right. the state steps in and says, no, Ed Johnson owned it, not Southern. Okay? He registered it, so therefore it belongs to him. But, yeah, I registered to use permission of a corporate corporate right of ways. Yeah, I've got that Supreme Court decision from uh, Susan O'Connor. Uh, Susan O'Connor or Susan McLean? Well, I'm on that channel secret. All right, who owns the roads? Technically, who owns the the road? If you want to get down to it. Uh, the uh, civilians, uh, well, basically the military is claiming it, but actually it goes back to the natives that uh, actually own what they call the trails. Nope. So the roads were turned into, from the trails were turned into roads. All roads in this country, paved highways in this country, okay, were laid out by the Army Corps of Engineers. Mm-hmm. All of them. All your cities. You got... Avenues going the same way in every city. You got streets going the same way, and and all this other stuff. It was all laid out by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, I gotta find that book. It's not gonna, you would hit me with something like that, wouldn't you? There's you know that's gonna there. happen, huh? I said you knew there's, that was gonna happen. There's a, there's an Army manual, all right. 
that actually tells you how to lay out roads in cities. Actually does it. Okay? Oh. Uh, there's a reason that they're laid out that way. All right? In case there's a war on this land, the army, all right, can use the roads. It states clearly, in, in, I got to find that thing. So I stuck it someplace on one of my flash drives. Uh, basically, I mean, when you build a bridge, what determines how that bridge is built? Is that one of those instruments you sent me about two years ago? What now? Was that one of the instruments instruments you sent me two years ago? It probably might be. Okay, I'll double check. We'll get that up. What determines how how a bridge how how it's built? It must be able to handle two of the largest vehicles that the army has. Mm -hmm. And at this moment. That's an M1 tank. Great. Right. That's 60 tons each, so it's got to be able to handle 120 tons. Mm hmm This whole thing is about the military, okay? And it's about immigration naturalization. There's all this country set up, and we're not the only one. I got somebody on my group site that's in France, and he went through my documents, and he couldn't believe it. He said, yeah, he said, he's a professor of law at a, at a, at a, um, a university over there. And he assured, affirmed to me that just about every major country in this planet is set up the same way. They're all ran on the military. Yeah. Everybody's in the militia. All right. Everybody is basically one giant... This planet is one giant army, except for the Muslim states. They're not set up that way. Mm -hmm. This is why they don't want the, the Sharia law in the United States. Well, I still can't believe they're throwing people in on the Koran and not, not the Bible, because even though I don't... I agree with the Bible, but I look at it as the devil's book, so. Bring him in, yeah. swear him in on the devil's book. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, I'm not going to get into that right now because it is. I know that. Neither one of them are going to get in because that's the one thing that uh, the great thing the Indian treaties and the Constitution made it equal rights for everybody to have their religion. Well, Except for Muslims, by federal Supreme Court, it's not even supposed to be in the country. But like I said, the problem with the Constitution is the Constitution does not apply in the state court. Mm -hmm. Now, certain parts of it under the fourth, whether you like the Fourteenth Amendment or not, certain parts of it under the incorporation doctrine of the Fourteenth Amendment were incorporated into the state. You want to look at the corporation doctrine, all right? And I'm not going to tongue wrestle with anybody over it. I get invited. Don't shoot the message like somebody on my group trying to shoot me, all right? Oh, I got to call it for what? No, you don't. You never had them, all right? And it's that simple, all right? You never had them. Well, yeah, why, why don't we get to the point? Uh, we, we've hit the point, so let's get into uh, answering questions, opening floor, so we can start batting this around with some people, too. Okay. All participants are unmuted. So anybody would like to speak up? Floor is yours. Nobody? Um, by the way, I have put this document into court and watch the fireworks. <laughs> oh no, I comprehend that. Like I said, I've done that and put similar documents in the way I put them together, put them in the court, and all of a sudden nobody hears from anything, and it's just like it just literally disappeared. Yeah, I always love it when a judge will say, "I'll take that under advisement." Oh, and yeah. Please look at the word under advisement. 
Well, that and the words, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not Man. kidding you, Your, Your Honor. We're not kidding you at all. This, you, you wrote this up. We didn't write this up. Man. Go it's ahead. Like, it's Go like ahead. The floor, floor is yours on the May I. Oh, hold on one second here. It's like here recently, right before, uh, back in, was it January? I was in court watching a guy that I've been working with, and he demanded the jurisdiction of the judge. Okay? And the judge said, well, I have jurisdiction over a territory. And he said, fine, I'll accept that. He said, would you kindly do me a favor? And the judge said, what's that? He said, define that territory. All right, the judge draw hit the floor. He said, the, the United States government, he said, has a bunch of stones around Washington, D.C. One side says Mer Virginia, Maryland. He said, the other side says jurisdiction of the United States. He mm -hmm. said, I would like you to show me the stones where your jurisdiction is. Do you know he couldn't do it? His jurisdiction stops in that courtroom. No. Anyhow, let's go ahead and let the May I speak so we didn't lose him. Go ahead, May I. Yeah, uh, Southern said that the Army Corps of Engineers uh, designed all these roads. And could someone please explain to me what the hell were they smoking when they did California's roads? <laughs> Buddy, I can't, I can't tell you, but I can tell you one thing. I, I always wondered why certain little dinky bridges I, were built to take a Mack truck weighing 90,000 pounds. Now I know why. They weren't designed to take that truck. They were designed to take a tank. Yeah, but most of the trucks uh, are the maximum load is 80,000 pounds. No, no, they have to apply for the fuel than any other port because you could have a troop standing on top of that tank. So they have to count yeah. that too. The gross, the gross weight and the net weight of uh, a trucks are two different things. But, uh, a friend of mine, I looked on the side of his, and his gross weight is 90,000 pounds. Now, he's got a uh, conventional Kenworth. No, I take that back by mistake. A conventional freight liner, okay, with a big sweeper on it. So, like I said, it, 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 I didn't, don't remember what the net weight was, all right, but uh, gross, the gross weight was 90,000 pounds, so that's what I'm going out on. You can look at any on any truck that runs interstate, and it's got a gross weight and a net weight on the side of it. Yeah, but uh, according to what DOT allows them to run, is the maximum weight that they can run. Uh, well, not now. They're they're road. They're basically going at their gross weight, but DOT only allows the truck to run at eighty thousand pounds uh, on their gro for them. And I know that's not their gross weight, but still uh legally that's what they want them to run at at eighty thousand pounds um but still it, the way they've designed some of these roads it makes you even wonder how would they get a deck on uh abram's tank on some of these roads because there's no way that damn thing would ever fit especially in san francisco those turns are so tight i mean no way you'd hit stuff all the way through well and i've traveled i've traveled from coast to coast with my dad and he was a truck driver and uh and i tell you right now some of these roads there's no way well you gotta remember something a, a track machine will will basically turn into its own footprint okay i don't know if you've ever driven track machines i've driven full tracks okay in the everglades it will step still in its own footprint and spin around in a circle you can get it to do it and these, yeah. and another thing to remember that in a time of war, they don't care about damage. <laughs> All they care about is getting someplace and fighting a battle. You follow me? Yeah, true. You know, and if it if you just happen to get in the way, it's like oh, when we when we were in Kuwait and that uh, and stuff like that in Afghanistan, your car got in the way. Hey. Guess what? We turned it into a pizza. A hundred and twenty thousand pound tank uh, against a car, that car don't stand a chance. 
friend of mine's son uh, is in the military, and I've seen some pictures that he sent out of what they do to cars. Um, hello? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. The floor is still yours, Dave. Oh, okay. Oh. And then we'll turn it over to the next guy after you're done finished, Dave. What I was going to ask is uh, I'm still not quite uh, clear on. So then, um, basically, is there a form or something we can do to get the children uh, away from these courts or so that they're not showing that they're abandoned? So that, because, I mean, you know, that that's part of the problem right now with uh, family courts. They turn around and do a presumption and then they uh, stick a, a father with um, a, a large sum. And in fact, I even heard of my dad tell me about a lawyer that was hit with such a high child support that, um, that he had to work two jobs and he was a divorce attorney anyway, but he had to work as a lawyer during the day. And then at night he was working at McDonald's to make up the, an additional payment. So he'd have something. Um, pissed so off the, how would, huh? He pissed off the wrong judge. <laughs> yeah. But no, there's I, a court. Huh? There's a court case. All right. Um, we're going back in the 2000s now, uh, 2005, 2006. It was a big court case back then. Where um, was it that long ago? Where a woman, I, uh, I hope there's no ladies on this call. Um, met a guy. He was a very rich man. I, right? and. They had sex, okay, and when she, what she did was she had used a cell condom, and she took the condom as soon as they were done, tied it up, and pretended to throw it away, but she didn't. She packed it in dry ice, and she took her to California, where she was artificially inseminated. Um, I don't know the final verdict of that, but I heard a rumor all right, that she, he was paying her like half a million dollars a year in child support. That's just a rumor. I don't know. I don't know the actual final outcome of it. Yeah, no, I've heard of it, and I never followed through on that one. But I know other women have done similar things. Well, the, the problem yeah, with child, the problem with child support. Um, is that every uh, child support, the Title 40 agency, they're all under contract to the United to Office of Child Support, Washington, D.C., which is a private corporation. All of these people out here that are running these um, child support agencies, they're operating private corporations. Mm-hmm. If you remember, um, oh, what's his name? Richard Fine in California. He caught the judges out there. Uh, he said it bezzling, like sixty thousand dollars a year a piece. It was four hundred million dollars a year. All right, they weren't embezzling it. They were under contract, okay, for child support these child support these services. And they turned the legislator out there in California turned around and gave those those judges retroactive immunity because everybody's on the take. The legislators, the governor, the judges. The, the clerk of the court, everybody is a, got a contract. <clears throat> uh, having said that, hold on one sec. I'll blow your mind. You want a good example of this? Hold on. Hold on one second. Let me find it. Isn't it? Okay, and the message I just got, I'm sending you a message back. Call me after 7, 10 p.m. Okay. Go ahead. This is Ohio statute. 
All right, you need to look this up and, and read this. If you want to get an idea, that's how bad this situation is. All right, this is a good one. Because <clears throat> it, it, it explains a lot. Ohio Statute 5105.12-1-80. That's Ohio Statute 5101.12-1-80. Dash one dash eighty. All right. Four four D contracts overview. You need to read that. <clears throat> These are all private corporations, private agencies doing business. And even the if you go down and read this whole section here, all right, it tells you who all is involved. Contractors refer to a private or government entity with whom the Child Support Enforcement Agency enters into a Title IV D contract. All right? Government entities include the following entities in the same county as the Child Support Enforcement Agency. The court, the prosecutor, or law enforcement, or other law enforcement officials, the sheriff, the clerk of the court, the county recorder, the treasurer's office, any other public or private agency or official. Now, think about that. That covers just about everybody. They're all on the take. All of them. Well, I know the attorney general has a private contract with the executive branch. Uh, that's why they get federal funding uh, every year. <clears throat> yep. Title IV, <clears throat> Title IV D is a complete fraud. It's peonage, debt slavery. All right? I've sent these people a nice little document, a hundred, one minute, like a hundred something page document. Uh, you, uh, that uh, they, They're committing a crime for all practical purposes, a big crime. Uh, under international law in 1925, all uh, right, you might want to look this up. The Slavery Conventions of 1925. Um, there's a bunch of them out there. They outlawed all forms of slavery, including debt slavery. Uh, hold on one second. Didn't have answered. We'll move on to see if anybody else got another question, and then we'll come back. Go ahead. Uh, listening to this, this is Rick, and uh, I'd ahead. like to throw back. I'd like to. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Rick. Well, the the thing is, is you know, it's been very interesting in seeing this, and I was divorced, had to pay child support, and all this. But there is an organization I'd like to, you know, if you and the listeners to. Uh, Look look into and think about. It's CASA, C A S A, which stands oh. for the acronym stands for uh, Court yeah. Appointed Special Advocate, and uh, it's all volunteer basis. And now that the uh, men are starting to stand up for their children more, I guess you could say that, or taking time out, and they're seeing how I hate to say it this way, corrupt the women are and how things work together so it coincides that the men pays the child support because the woman isn't. CASA is a really, really outstanding program. It goes in there as unbiased as possible and can look into that child, and it's the child's representative. And uh, I have personally sat on the board of a CASA organization here in Wyoming, and we have some wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, volunteers. You have to go through a training program and everything. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing about that is, you know, I'm going to be a uh, devil's advocate and, and stick up for the men right now because, you know, I'm a male. And, you know, the thing that lots of times happens, the male wants to get involved with the children, but the mother won't allow that to happen. And when they go to the... Uh, child custody court and everything 
uh, child protective services are on the mother's side most of the time, or they're or they're so doggone booked up that they can't get there. But the thing is, is this CASA representative will go in there because the father will be complaining, hey, you know, my kids don't get their their child support. They're always in the same rags. They're always, you know, dirty. Their ba- uh, uh, diapers are always dirty. And what happens is they'll start listening to the father. And just because Child Protective Service or or whatever goes out there and say, we're going to go check on mom, well, mom knows about it, you know, a week before she gets there. So the house is all cleaned up. The kids are all cleaned up. Hell, they're going to buy brand new clothes. What's good about CASA, that volunteer can show up three days before that appointment and actually go see it. And we had volunteers that would actually do that. They would show up at two o'clock in the morning because they'd say mama was out drinking all night and having, you know, entertaining it until four o'clock. And they would go out there. And, and a lot of times because they were uh, special advocates, the judge would take that into high consideration. And I've seen the custodies turn over to the fathers. And of course the fathers took care of it. But at the same time, the same thing goes and applies to the women. Because nowadays, more and more men are getting what they call joint custody. And the way they came up to that compromise in the corporation is it don't make no difference who's get the child. They have to pay child support, period. In the old days, if you you got full custody or joint custody, basically no child support was paid because it was deemed both parents' responsibility. Well, yeah, but, I'd like to add something to that on CASA because in Oregon State, CASA is, well, I haven't been dealt with it recently, but in the past it's had major conflicts because it's always been in the favor of the state because most of the CASA workers in Oregon, and Oregon State funds CASA personally. Oh, whole, man, really? CASA is funded by the state itself, not by a private industry or another structure. So that's where I have a problem with the conflict of interest. Yeah, well, here I'm calling from Wyoming. And in Wyoming, last I've seen, was it was an all-volunteer. They raised money. Well, in fact, they still raise money. And it's, a uh, quote-unquote, as unbiased as possible. Of course, you know, they've got to go by the judge's uh advisement and some of them will not allow casa into their court system well yeah I, I come from a- this is that i go on this angle because i don't want a judge to have the judge jury and hangman it has to be a grand jury and that's what you want to file for is a grand jury hearing you don't want to go into and have a judge decide your case because that's still an administrative court well, hold, 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 hold on a second. Let me explain how child support really works, okay? Mommy and daddy have a kid. Mommy and daddy's social security numbers is such a child support, okay? Mommy and daddy money comes out of their child support, out of their social security accounts and goes to the state. The state pockets that money. Now, mm-hmm. when mommy goes down and applies for child support, She's child support or alimony, either one. She's actually applying for welfare. It's under the Social Security Act. It's welfare. Now they that's, give mommy the welfare money. Wrong. Okay, they give mommy the welfare money. What's happening that fathers aren't aren't realizing is that they're coming after the father to reimburse the state for the money that they gave the mother, so they can put it back in their pockets. Yep. And, and, that's see, that's what, and, that's, and see, that's the part there that really chapped my britches and got me going. And, you know, it's supposed to be an equity or equal payment. Now, I'm all for the corporation doing what they got to do as long as mommy meets daddy's payment to the same account. Different wow. routing, but the same account. That way, if mama is supposed, if daddy is supposed to pay four hundred dollars per child, he has three. That's twelve hundred dollars, which means the total child support of that those three children is twenty four hundred bucks. 
Hell, there's mothers out there that can't even raise 600 bucks and live totally on the child support. So that is totally, I believe, one way and bias as a son of a gun because if mama had to put the same amount of money in the account and basically get her check written back to her, those kids wouldn't be getting paid. They would really understand that mama can't live and support her own children and the father can. Let, and let you know me, what? I've asked you. that, I've asked that, and no, everybody turns a blind ear and eye to it because they just don't want to have that done. And that's well, why a lot of times the, parent, the father has to go back and take advantage of every check or money order that he's ever written and keep track of it like you were paying for your doggone car until it turned 18 years old. And they well, conveniently I'm, always misplace, misguide, or put the money in someplace else. And you're the guilty one before you even have a chance to show that you didn't. Well, I almost had to be escorted by, out by two police officers until they found out that they I, I was lucky. I caught up to it when I was only like $1,800 in the hole, which I wasn't. I was ahead of the ball game, But uh, they had a quote-unquote miscalculation and misplacement of monies and say so if they had their mother doing the same thing then you would have a mother and father mommy and daddy going in there screaming why is my dog gone now they take your uh, what do you call it they take your uh, irs check and they take your driver's license away they take your professional license away mm -hmm. if you're a it's back welder or whatever they take that away but I guarantee you, if Mama had to participate just like Papa, there'd be a lot more Papas owning, not owning, having their having their children. Yep. And, and that's why the uh, courts lean more towards the women because they're supposed to be the most nurturing types. But yep. I think some men not right, uh, one at a time. One at a time. Go ahead. Let me let me let, let me tell you something. Okay. The what you what you got going on here with child support? Well, like I said, is a recoupment for from a welfare recoupment. Now that money is going in the state pockets. All right. Yep. Uh, a lot of that money is is not. Let me explain this. Uh, I'm going to send Dad this document. It's called uh, Child Support Debt Slate. All right. He'll post it on the wall. It's a hundred and something pages long, right? I sent this document to child support and they've ignored it because I got them. And when I tell you I got them, I got them, all right? First off of that is peonage. I don't give a shit, okay? What the what the, the courts say is, oh, it's all peonage. Climate versus United States, 197 U.S. 207, 15, 1905, all right? What is peonage? The basal fact of indebtedness. If you owe a debt, all right, you are in peonage. They have never overturned that case. I got a certified copy when I was in D.C. last year all right, from the Supreme Court. It has never been overturned. So if you owe a debt, you are in peonage. Any form of indebtedness is peonage. I don't care what it is. Now, Okay. Uh, according to 42 U.S.C. 1994, peonage is defined as a condition of enforced servitude by which the servitor is compelled to labor against his will in the liquidation of some debt or obligation, either real or pretended. All right. Hold on. That's the kicker point. People don't comprehend that word pretended either. Yeah, well, hold on one second. I'm going to read both this guy's mind. I'm really going to blow his mind. Uh, go ahead. Let me find this other document. Okay, go ahead, Rick. Finish up, and then we'll go back to Dave, and then we'll come back. I just wanted, I just wanted to say that much, and, uh, you know, maybe one day we'll get uh, both equities in there paying the same debt and let the debt itself see who owns or who will get custody of the child. 
Because right now, a child can wait until they're 12 years old and decide for themselves. And thank you very much for allowing me to participate. Oh, absolutely, Rick. But see, that's the one thing that people don't comprehend, how this craziness works, you know. And, you know, and I I know when they did that administrative role back when, you know, kids at 12 could decide what parent they want to live with. Okay. I mean, that happened in the 70s. And, you know, I grew up and I literally went through that because I grew up, you know, had divorced parents. But see, the thing is, it's, it's craziness how all this stuff goes out and we're brought up with all this craziness around us. And the whole point is that we start doing this is like, you know, run for office, like they brought up dealing with, you know, they're talking about drug and alcohol and addicts. And excuse me, you know, drug and alcohol uh, alcoholics are programmed that way because first time everybody did drugs in happy times and they never got addicted. And then they turned it into a depressant. And once it turned into a depressant, then you got to go back and find out where it started and where it ended of your happy time to the depressant to really kick it. But see, it's not an alcoholic or drug addict. It's a guy or a woman who gave up their rights and responsibilities because they didn't want to be responsible anymore. And then it's going to be responsible again. Go ahead. The floor is back to you. Let me tell you a secret. And I don't want to make anybody mad, men, women, or anybody here. Okay? You all know what a DNA test is, correct? Say that again about DNA test. You know what the, the alleged DNA test is, right? Right. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. Have you anybody ever heard of the Geno Project? Oh, yeah. The Geno Project is a group of scientists who are tracking the movements of the people across this planet from ancient times until now through their... <coughs> <coughs> Through their DNA. Okay? Now, there was an article out there, which I, I'm trying to refine it. Basically, there is a, a maximum of law, all right, that goes like this the mother is always certain, the father is always uncertain. Okay? Mm-hmm. Right, that's it. They have a presumption that if you're married to a woman, it's your child. Okay? Now, and with the Geno Project put a thing out, and unfortunately, somebody told me about it, and I didn't get it, and I've been trying to find it. They have been trying to find it. The Geno Project can only track, are you ready for this? One father to one child out of one million pairs. Wow. If it wasn't for mitochondria DNA, they'd be out of a job. And that goes to the mother. Has anybody ever heard called up uh, Social Security and they go, Who's your, what's your father's name? No, they always ask for the mother's name. That's mm-hmm. why. They cannot prove that. What they're using is a test. And I did an investigation a few years ago on this. All right? When they say we're 99%, they never say 100, 99% that this could be the father of the child. Why are they only 99% that he could be? Because you are in a class of group of people that could range between 100,000 and a million. What happened to you? Claim words, they don't care. <clears throat> Do you know anything about child support? They don't care who the father is. They just want a father for that kid. Somebody to don't pay child to. And that's it. Many years back, um, you heard of Maury Povacek? Oh, yeah, when he had his talk show. Did you, uh, anybody here besides me catch the talk, the one that the, the people wore the boom money? Mm. Maury Povacek, they, they did a blood test of this man, woman, and baby. Now, the first question is, if you're determining paternity, all right, for a man, why do you need the mother 
to give a blood sample or DNA sample. That should be right there, right off the bat. Okay? That should be a red flag right off the bat. If you can't do it without the mother, you got a problem. So people went on Maury Povacek. Maury Povacek did this usual thing, a man of Walmart fighting. They were, and it was funny. All of a sudden, he pulls out this thing and goes, you are the father of the child. These people broke out laughing. And he's sitting there looking around like, what the hell is going on? All right? And he said, do you think that's funny? And the lady looked over and said, yeah, because they're not one of those Blood sample was a snake and the other one was an elephant. I went, what? Yes. You heard me correctly. One was a snake and the other one was an elephant. And they said that the elephant was the father. No, the snake was the father. The snake was the father. Yeah. The snake was the father of the baby elephant. Now, you figure that one out. That was on Maury Povacek. That now, was the time he went off the air. <laughs> One other time, Jeff. Now, in 1941, um, Office of Attorney General, Washington, D.C., December 12, 1941, circular number 3591, to all alleged United States attorneys, involuntary servitude, slavery, and peonage. This document basically tells all these people that this is illegal. Involuntary servitude, okay, and paying it. And yes, it's in this document I got here, all right, with all those little footnotes. Okay, hold on one second. I'm going to look up some. And we'll get this stuff posted, and I'll have it on the uh, Facebook pages, too. All right, if you read the human trafficking laws, this is human trafficking. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Department of Justice and Voluntary Slavery, Penage, uh, 18 U.S.C. 1581, 1584, 1589. Hold on. I'm looking for something in particular here. So give me a minute. There's a big document. So while you're doing that, let's go back to Dave. Dave, bring up and finish up your point. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I've been listening, y'all. Uh, just to bring up that um, now, y'all do know that there in all the states there is no state law that says you have to pay child support. Yep. You got a state court that is pushing a federal law, which they cannot do. It's a federal not- administrative rule. Well, wait a minute. Hold on. The child support system was created by the judges. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the history, okay? The Civil War happened. There were 200,000 injured, uh, injured people, okay, came out of that war. 200,000 crippled men, all right? 800,000, 680,000 or 800,000 people died in that war. So the United States government started sending money out to the states. This is where you get your child support from, people. All right, there's actually a book that tells you this, but I can't find it. it they just pulled it off the damn internet. All right? These people said, wait a minute. Why are we giving this money to, the, to these mothers and these children, okay, Well, we can take this money and put it in our pocket, all right, and dump the fathers back on and make the fathers pay for these kids while we pocket the money? Mm-hmm. All right? And this is how child support got started. All right, the states didn't even have a law on this shit until 1910 when the Uniform State Law Commission, a bunch of lawyers up in Chicago that meet every year and write legislation, or as they call them, acts, okay? Now, in 1910, they wrote the first child support laws to these states. But hell, the states are going to make money off of this, so of course they're going to do it even though it's against the law. Okay? Um, and this, the federal government didn't get involved until 1975. Yep. Up, in, up until uh, 1994, 
I under I have to look it up. The nineteen uh, thirty five Social Security Act and the amendment to nineteen thirty nine of the Social Security Act all have a provision in there that you can't touch those social security accounts. Now, in nineteen ninety four, right? In 1990, no, 1954, I think it is, 1954, there was an IRS code added to the IRS that allowed these people to step into these accounts and rape, rob, and pillage them. Mm-hmm. And they've been doing it ever since. Okay? Now, now you've got the history of how this all came to be. This was done under case law by the courts. Mm-hmm. All right, up in, like I said, up until 1910, there was no child support legislation in place. But this started in about 1870. So do the math. 70, that was part of uh, um, uh, Pelosi, Boxer, Brown, everybody's bills back then was people in Chicago, New York. Uh, and so, yeah, I remember that because uh, uh, me and my brother, we were... We're in the paper poster kids for that. And I believe he said 1870s. If you remember that, okay. <laughs> I didn't want to say nothing. 1970 is... No, so go ahead. 18, 1870. Okay. That is all, around 1870 this all started. Like I said, the lawyers came up with a really good plan. We'll steal the money that's coming in from the federal government, just like they're doing now. We'll put it in our pockets. We'll make money off of it. Everybody gets rich, and we'll, we'll get the father to pay the child, pay our debt. And that's how it went down. That's the gist of it. They're doing the same thing today. Money's coming into the state, all right, but the state wants to keep that money. Hmm. I mean, they got to have sweat funds, all right, to go party on and stuff like that, people. <laughs> and don't forget, they keep reinvesting that in uh, municipal bonds and stuff, too. Yeah, and stocks and bonds, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's something out there called called the Collected Undistributed Child Support Fund. Mm-hmm. All right? This is, uh, this is in this document that I, I sent to these people. Believe me, that's going to blow your mind. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of collected undistributed child support funds. Now, I'm going to read... This is 42 U.S.C. 1994, peonage abolished. The holding of any person to service or labor under the system known as peonage is abolished and forever prohibited in any territory or state of the United States. And all acts, law, listen carefully, in all acts, laws, resolutions, orders, regulations, and usage of any territory or state all right, which have therefore established, maintained, enforced, or by virtue of of which any attempt shall hereafter be made to establish, maintain, or enforce directly or indirectly the involuntary, the voluntary, listen carefully, the voluntary or involuntary service or labor of any person as peons in liquidation of any debt or obligation or otherwise are declared null and void. That is 42 U.S.C. 1994. Hello? Yeah, we're listening. <laughs> are you listening, though? And that was again yeah. U.S.C. code what? 42 USC 1994. Now you know why these people hate my guts, Ed? I know why they hate mine too, so. <laughs> well, that's why I, when I when I do this, and I'm gonna, we're going to give it back to Dave here in a minute so you can finish with The one thing is, like I tell, I ask people, you know, did you file? Because you and I have a conflict because I mean, you can file it on your bloodline because I own mine. And that's what freaked them out when it when it went through. And then when I got mine through with the Secretary of State and the way I did it, they sure didn't want anybody else to do it. 
And so, well, because I separated, because the state is a corporation. I'm not part of a corporation, and I'm sure the hell ain't no person. The person. Yeah, everybody puts, let me tell you something. Everybody well, puts too much stock in that word person. Okay? They, 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 they do. I'm not it's a person. A word, it's the word individual that you better get. Well, either one. I not. I was like, that. He didn't listen. Go ahead. I said it's a word individual that you better get. Mm -hmm. Corporate, all right. All these laws apply to to individuals and persons. You also That's want to read C L Y A T T I S versus United States, 197 U.S. 207 215 1995. This case has not been overturned. And I hold a certified copy from. The, the Supreme Court, when I went to Washington, D.C. Well, I'm working this, on fine because I'm going after this treaty that was done in 1828. And in that way, no native could be classified as anything but native. So I'm working on that one. And I have those court cases. I put that up. I have the whole thing. I'll email that to you so you can look at what I got. Because see, I even have the Supreme Court document, and I even had a copy from the Supreme Court stating that, but they wouldn't certify it for me. Well, listen, um, just in case I get cut off here, because <clears throat> my phone does this at two hours, and we're already at two hours. Oh, okay. I, I will send this to you, okay? Like I said, there's 100-something pages. Like I said, 1925, they outlawed all forms of slavery. When I see all forms, I am talking death slavery. I am talking uh, any for peonage, it's all outlawed under international law. All right? It is a crime considered a crime against humanity. All right? And if it's done during a war, which we weren't during a war up until July 10th, 2015, all right? the Civil War ended that day. All right? It is considered all right, a war crime. I like that one. All right. So who it is considered a war crime. Up. You will also find that in the international. Um, oh hell, I can't think of what they are now. International Commission of Red Cross or something like that. They talk about about deaths, about slavery, forms of slavery. Mm -hmm. They cannot make you pay a debt. Right. And so we'll get that up. So if we're doing that, let's get back to Dave, and then we got to open up the floor for somebody else. We still got a couple other people here that uh, had their hand up too. So hopefully we haven't lost them. Listen, if I if I lose you, I'll call it back in. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because I mean we want to finish with Dave. Let's get a couple other people going on their questions. So Dave, finish up, and then we'll open up the floor because we all we don't want to be running past seven. All right. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to bring up is that it's literally written in the uh, uh, was it the child support uh, attorney, uh, the attorney general, the the hands child support. If you look it up, uh, you'll see it. It's actually written in there that child support is not to benefit the mother or the child. So if it doesn't benefit them, then that means uh, as uh, Southern is saying. The money is definitely going back into their pockets, and for every mm -hmm. that they get, the judges get, uh, that goes towards their uh, retirement fund. That, thank you. I, we didn't get into that, but that's an actual fact, because every time they do that, they do get uh, 8% that goes into their retirement fund. Yeah, and also, uh, well, when the attorneys go up and talk to the judges, they uh in that um uh, there's a video that's on uh netflix um uh, it's something about divorce um anyway they the guy literally says yeah um uh, the judge will literally make them bargain say how much you're gonna how much you're gonna give me to side with your client and it's <laughs> gone up ten twenty thousand dollars so that they're actually taking bribes 
to decide who's going to get the trial uh, when you go into court. So, mm-hmm. and, and then a lot of these attorneys, uh, they charge, yeah, three, four, five, seven hundred dollars. And one of them even literally said, Do I think I'm worth that much? No, but I'm going to charge it. Because why? Because you're in dire need. So for us to be sitting here uh, uh, going to the attorneys, which you have definitely proven, uh, shown it in Bouvier's book, that every time you hire an attorney, you waive your constitutional rights. These attorneys are not out to help you. They don't care about you. Uh, yeah. Was it one of the ones that I went to sat there, and, and as I was just talking to him, he's just signing away on papers. Uh, uh-huh, uh-huh, that bitch. I mean, and just going right at it, it's like he's heard it so many times, he doesn't really care. He's like, yeah, I've heard all this. Just let it get out of the system, charge him what I'm going to charge, and then go in and just do their little thing and then come back out and then move on to the next case. And they have about five or six cases in the morning. So, I mean, I'll there's you, nothing new that – Huh? <clears throat> let me tell you a secret. There is a thing called inappropriate assistance of counsel. Okay? Mm-hmm. You can sue a lawyer for failure to properly represent you for inappropriate assistance of counsel. I think we okay. put that law up on the website, the, the law, and that's also, too, from the Bar Administrative Bar Association. Well, I know somebody, several people who are working right now to sue these lawyers for inappropriate assistance of counsel because they never brought up the fact that debt slavery is outlawed Penage is outlawed, all right? They got my documents. One guy is, as soon as they put him on child support, he turned to his lawyer and said, I hope you got a good lawyer. And the guy said, why? He said, because, buddy, he said, you didn't do shit for me. He said, hand me up on a silver platter. I was sitting right there when he did it. They said, what do you mean? We have the law. He said, yeah, and I got it too. And when he got, and his lawyer got this, all right, his, that lawyer went crazy because, None of this ever gets brought up in a courtroom. None of it. None of it. <clears throat> you got to understand, <clears throat> everybody from the judge down is on the freaking take. They're under contract to do certain things, establish paternity, by whatever means necessary, adjudicate you, con you into being the child's father, whatever, okay? And to put you on child support. And they get, the, the, the people get bonuses for the most people they put on child support. The most money they collect, they get bonuses for this shit. Yep, they do. And, and, I got, and, and these lawyers don't tell you this. They don't. Well, they don't tell you that they reinvested into a stock exchange of their own bar administrative that goes back to the municipality bonds. There's a lot of stuff these people aren't telling you. And we need to start suing them for, for inappropriate assistance to counsel. Hey, now, father? I know two people that have filed this, all right, and they 12 be 6 did because, God forbid, <clears throat> with the stuff I got on, on child support, um, there's some people out there that claim to be knowledgeable on this, but with the, my PNH documents and stuff, they don't stand a chance in court. That's why they 12 be 6 did. Mm-hmm. I dare you to state a claim for which relief can be granted because God knows the, the, everybody in that courtroom, everybody in that courtroom is under a contract to screw you over. How can you mm-hmm. possibly win? All right, let him finish. Uh, let him finish. We got two other people that had their hand raised. I know I got the, the button pushed over here off of FB. So let Dave finish up and let's, let's open up the floor because it's 7 o'clock now. And so we don't want to keep going too late because you know we we got a family that's around, so we got to take we got to think about that. Okay. No, the only thing I, the only thing I have to ask is uh, is there a statute of limitation on that? And after that, I yield. No, there used to be statutes of limitations on it. Yeah, Michigan was ten years. I don't remember what. I think Florida was seven or eight. But they enacted a thing called the Bradley Amendment, and the Bradley Amendment. Hold on. I got that on here. Hold on one oh, second. Oh, you got to send me that. Oh, I've been waiting for that one. The Bradley, the, what the Bradley Amendment basically says, all right, is you can you cannot forgive retroactive child support. Now, um, and you cannot 
See, when, you, when you're when you put on child support, they're not telling you that there is an automatic lien put on <laughs> On you, your home, your car, everything. Everything you own. All right? Now, I got into it here a while back, seven, eight months ago. I won't talk to this clown anymore. I won this, uh, this case. I won this case. Yes, you won this case. But did you get the lien removed? And he asked, well, the case is gone, so the lien is gone. No, the lien is not gone. You still have to go to the lien office, and you have to do it. Exactly. Go ahead. Tell them. No, no, no. You can't do it. This is a non-expiring lien. You cannot remove that lien. Well, no, you can, so long as you're able to file that you are the injured party. No, sir. You cannot remove it. Oh, i got to find that Supreme Court ruling on that. That was just done in 2009. The Bradley Amendment. Hold on a minute. I'm trying to find it here. Um, Yeah, I know what you're talking about, but they just passed that in 2009 or 11, because if you can prove you were the injured party, then the lien has to be removed, and if not, then you can sue the lien holder. Well, I'm telling you right now. uh, Hold on. I'm telling you right now, I know somebody who bragged to me that he got rid of his child support debt, okay, because he proved that it wasn't his kid. All right, that worked right up until the time that he retired two years ago. Uh, he retired two years ago. All right. Uh, guess what happened when he retired, people? All right. They went after his Social Security account. Now the poor asshole be <coughs> it saved fifteen hundred dollars a month out of his Social Security account, and living on nine hundred. And you know what they told him? The judge, sorry, it's a non-expiring lien. It cannot be removed. Uh, it cannot that, be. Oh, I question that. Amendment. Huh? Me, myself, and I question that. Well, I'm questioning it too, but he's been fighting in court now but ever since he retired. I'm getting his butt handed to him. The Bradley Amendment basically says, all right, the law overrides any state statute of limitations. The law disallows any judicial discretion, even from bankruptcy judges. The law requires that the payment amounts be maintained without regard to the physical capability of the person owing some child support to promptly notify the authority of changes in their circumstances or to a, or their Awareness of the need to make the notification. Okay, we'll get that up. Let, let, let's open up. Let's get the other couple of questions because it's seven fifteen, and uh, let's get the other couple done, and then uh, uh, you know, because we'll close up here in about fifteen minutes. I don't want to keep pushing it. So I know there was two other hands raised. Dave, you finished your question, did you, or not? Oh, yeah, I'm done. I yield. Okay. Now, I know that we had two other questions. I just had to crash my computer again and bring it back up because all of a sudden it started flashing on me. That's interesting. When your computer starts flashing it, your screen starts going beep, beep, beep. So, but anyhow, I know we had two other hands raised. So those two other hands, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Well, no speaking on that one. So, and then also, too, don't forget Chapter 943. I'll put it back up. This is dealing with Department of Law Enforcement. People need to start reading what these things really say compared to what you think they say. Yeah, you because know, law enforcement only has certain powers, and especially when they're rent to cops, city cops, and all this, they have certain delegations they have authority of and don't have authority of. Well, I know well, it. 
red well, policy officers are. Wait a minute. They have no authority because the bottom line, I'll, like I said, I'm Well, they have the authority. If you want to give me the authority, I'll take the authority. But wait a minute. The governor has to call forth the militia to enforce the law. Not the sheriffs, not the Hollywood police, not any of the people. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> All right. He has to call forth the militia. Now, that's under Article... Oh, shit. Article 4. I don't remember the section of the Florida Constitution. But it's... In no, I agree. It's under, yeah, we already had that conversation before, too. Now, but go ahead. If you go down to Article 10, Section 2... It tells you that everybody's in the militia. But now here's the problem. Up until the age of 52 or something like that. No, in Florida, it does, in Florida, let me tell you something. It doesn't matter. There's no age limit. It, 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 you're talking well, maybe general, in your area, but out here, it's 50. You better read it again because I'm telling you right now, okay? This is how they're getting jurisdiction over a lot of people, and they don't realize it. All right, the slavery is outlawed. The only form of slavery that's a, that's left in this country, all right, in this planet, is military conscription. All right, climate versus United States. All right, that's it. There's no other form of slavery left. And what is going on here is these people got you in, in the military. If you're if you're not in that military. You show me where on the United States Constitution or your state constitution, okay, that these people have jurisdiction and authority over you. It's real simple. It's called commander-in-chief of the militia. Now, under the United States military, there is a age cap, but not these state militaries. No. No matter what it says, you're presumed when you walk in that courtroom, to be someone that judge has jurisdiction under that state flag, not the federal flag, the state flag, because you're presumed automatically to be a member of the state militia. Uh, I gotta go to that because I know in Oregon the state militia and our structure says fifty. Yeah, <clears throat> if you're fifty-five years old walking into a courtroom and you got those flags, you're automatically presumed to be a member of the state militia that he has jurisdiction over. No, not well. Actually, they won't. Uh, I've been informed they won't allow me in the courtroom. Yeah, well, they don't like me in there either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody got any other questions? Hello? Well, I guess not at this point because I guess the other two weren't speaking up. I don't know what happened to them. The one dropped off of FB, and so anyhow, with that, if we don't got no other further, we'll get this stuff posted up. We'll get it on the Facebook links of uh, Oregon, New Oregon Trackers. We'll get it on the United States for Elected and Public Employees Oversight Committees. We'll get it up on the Recall Kate Brown, and we'll definitely get it up on the Civil War of 1866. And see, that's the one thing that people, you know, uh, uh, that's the whole point. We fought the Civil War. We fought it against a foreign country. We fought World War One with a foreign country. Well, go ahead. I have been trying to get these courts under a want of jurisdiction to tell me the jurisdiction of the judges <clears throat> and these courts and these police over the people. Okay? Now, technically... They never answered. They never answered it. All right. They come up with some stupid oh, out jurisdiction over the territory. Well, show me the territory. Now the police are in the ball game. You're, these police, because they work for a foreign corporation. All right. I use the word foreign not to mean that that the, some offshore corporation. They're foreign. All right. To the state militia. And under the state, I have a document somewhere. I have to find it. It lists all the state laws that prohibit the private militia. I think I gave that to you. No, I have it that I posted up. I have one from you and I have one from another. And I have it that uh, the whole thing is the private. Uh, you're talking about the private militia with the sheriffs and that include the police department, right? Well, they try to say that the private militia is the people out here training uh, uh, the ordinary people. 
But that's not the private militia. The private militia is the people that work for the private corporations, a.k.a. City of Seattle, I, or... or Oh, no, I got you on that one, but I just want to confirm. So I have both of them. I have the one I have, and I have the one that you sent me. Okay. You know, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, they don't like what the stuff that I've come up with. They're not very happy with me. Well, you think they're happy with me? I just sat there in a public meeting and told them, oh, that's right. You don't have to pay property tax. Here's the actual law. You know, and everybody's like, you know, and I mean, I can just watch their expressions because, excuse me, what? And then you want to charge me property taxes for my manufactured home? You can't do that because it's not a fixed structure. You can't charge any taxes, but the only way you can charge property taxes is on a business corporation. Private property and your personal assets are not a uh, public corporation, so they can't charge you taxes. I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, I have all that, and even the Supreme Court rulings on that. And the thing is, is that they were shocked. And like I said, when I was impressed, when Commissioner Hall, you know, stated on record, "Oh, that's right. You don't. Uh, what is that? That's right. Yeah, the Sheriff's Department has no right to leave a courtroom, but the people wanted it. The people didn't want the sheriff coming in." foreclosing on their homes and throwing a mass on the street because they didn't pay some uh, so-called uh, corporation tax for the city, county, and state. So, I mean, this is all real, folks, when they do this stuff, when they come after you. So that's why when it comes after you and they say, oh, we're going to foreclose, you have to go to a grand jury court. Never, ever go in front of a judge. A well, judge that, works for administrative corporation. A grand, you were talking appellate jury. You're not talking grand jury. <clears throat> all right, all right. Well, yeah, okay. A lawful jury. No, let's just no. yeah, let's just make clarify. A lawful jury. Well, there's no lawful juries in the United States. Well, you there is. That? If you and I are, we're not a corporation. We're not registered. Okay, let me explain this. The people sitting on that jury are members of the state militia. They only can judge someone on the state militia. Yeah, but you have to prove there are state militia because right now you get a jury. No, you got no. the mayor, the city council, his brother, his sister. Wait a minute, wait a minute. listen to me. Something happened down here that I'm, I'm not going to go into detail. Somebody did, did their status correction, okay? And they went into court. They had a court case. They wanted a jury. And the judge looked at them and said, you know damn good and well. I, there's not a jury in this state that we convene over you and dismiss the case. I would like to get a copy of that one because I comprehend that one. It, it was all verbal. I, and I'm telling you right now, they didn't want nothing to do. That judge didn't want nothing to do with him. I, and he did, that's exactly what he said. There's no jury I can convene that has jurisdiction over you. That goes back to Florida Constitution, I, Article 1, Section 7. The, okay. the military will be subordinate to the civil. Those people on that jury are, mili are militia. That judges military, I, with those military flags. Oh, clarify that, that one. Huh? Clarify that last part you just said before you go further. What part? About... It's in They're every supposed state to be suburban to the civil? No, that's right. The military is subordinate to the civil. So if you have members sitting on a jury I, that are state militia members under the Constitution, Article 1, Section 7, I mean, Article 10, Section 2 um, of the Florida Constitution and Title 250 2 of the Florida Statute, all members, everybody's a militia. Militia cannot sit in judgment over a civilian. Mm -hmm. They can't do it. They don't have authority over it. And that includes any elected and public employee and contractor thereof. Well, no. Because you oh, see, yes. I, well, at least on the West Coast, that is. It, it all depends on what they're called. If they're called civil government, then they are the civils. See, certain people... 
Well, that's true. Civil. There is, we do have an actual civil government, but most people don't comprehend. We do have a civil military that is not generally known or publicly known. Well, the, the catch is most of the judiciary are civil. They're under, I have to look this up. I got it stuck someplace. But if they're under the civil. It's under Title 10 United States Code. Who mm-hmm. is not in the militia. Okay? And one of them is the judiciary. Now, that's why a judge can put you into civil contempt. Because he is subordinate. You have to be subordinate to the judici- to the civil. All right? But once you are a civilian, all right, that judge and you are on equal footing, and there's no jurisdiction there. You follow me? Oh, I got you. That's what I put in my letter. Everything I do, everything is breast. Civilian, lawful, bloodline native, and I quote the actual court case in it. Well, you, all you need to do is establish the fact that you're a civilian. Okay? A civilian. No, I, I have to use the, the treaty because of my uh, native and it's filed. Well, trust me, the word civilian will carry you further than all the treaties you got. Trust me on that. I comprehend that, that. and people need to type in what civilian is and start doing this. When you go to court, is learn that, you know, to know your standing. Go ahead. You look it up in in Oregon Constitution. It's in there. The the military will be subordinate to the civil. It's in every constitution in every state. Well, I let me rephrase that. About thirty of them (laughs) that I looked up. I got you. All right. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and go through everybody's constitution. You can look it up yourself. But the military will be subordinate to the civil. This is why uh, people sitting on a jury, unless they're civilians, cannot sit in judgment of a civilian. Because they're in a militia. Mm-hmm. Oh. But see, that's why I was freaked out the, the deal when I deregulated myself the way I did. I mean, you know, and it's interesting when you got Congressmen and senators tell you, well, seeing what you did, Ed, I can't talk to you. That's right. Because, well, you got to understand something. They got hidden agendas. They don't want out. Uh, yeah, I know, because that way they lose their retirement. And one of them is this military side of this thing. They don't want this out at all. That one I totally comprehend, and people got to realize that. Anyhow, it's almost 7.30, uh, right. so what we're going to do is go ahead and wrap it up. Why don't you uh, give your, uh, if you want to put out one of your sites or anything, why don't you do that, and then we'll go uh, wrap it up. That's okay. Okay. Anyhow, we'll get the other information while we've been bouncing around tonight in the conversation. You, anybody who has my email, you know my Facebook pages, United States for America, Elected and Public Employees Oversight Committees. Then we also, too, have the United States for, I mean, the uh, Civil War of 1866. And that goes back to the treaties and stuff like that. Then we have the structure of Recall Cape Brown, as well as Oregon Trackers Facebook. And so we, you can always respond. If you want to join these things, please do. We've had uh, 35 to 40 new people just this week alone join us. People are starting to see what we're doing, we're bringing this stuff out, you know, sometimes me and my guests might always agree, we might agree, we might not always agree, but it's putting these pieces together so we can sit there and we're making the soup so we can see how it's going to taste, and so that's the point, you need to know how it's going to use in court for you, you need to know how it's going to use in life, and this is the main thing that the whole point about all this is please start educating your children as young as five. They can get it when they're eight years old. I'm going to tell you, they get it. I mean, I got a lot of this stuff when I was going from 11 to 15. I just shut my mouth, listened, and I couldn't believe half the stuff I was putting the pieces together. Kids do get this stuff, so don't disregard them. So... You know, what we're going to do is we're going to call it an evening. We appreciate everybody joining. Go ahead. Do you want to say something? Nope, I'm done. Okay. Anyhow, we uh, would like to thank thank everybody. 
on this, anybody can contact me. You go to New Dot Oregon Trackers website. You can always email me. I'd be more than happy to email you the situation and packages I've got on the instruments and documents and court cases to help you in the deal. And if you're going through this stuff with child support or these things, you know, it's like the one thing that I've done, and I got other associates that listen to us and that sometimes speak, that we know that you have to prove ownership of that child. And so you can always ask the court who owns the child. But when you go to court, definitely never, ever go to court and ask. Put it in writing. File it before you go to court. Because if it ain't filed, it does not exist. Because when you go in these, this, uh, these district courts, it's called hearsay evidence. It doesn't apply. So make sure it's in a paper instrument before you get there. Because if you have questions of the judge, you go, the front page this, this line that. And if you got the resources, cover it front and back. Because judges will flip the paper over and say, well, I didn't see that. When it's on the back side, they can't deny it. I mean, that's federal court case. It's, it's, it's learning how the manipulation of this crap has been played on us. And so we're going through this trauma. And so, like I said, I plan on getting this talk show I did yesterday together. I'm going to do some pieces. We'll cut it up and put it together with some of the responses from the other candidates. We'll put it up with the response, especially with, you know, the county commissioner meeting. Yeah, the sheriff's department has no authority, but the people want it. So I am going to be questioning that in my letter coming up uh, on my campaign speech. You know, he said the people wanted it, so the people want the sheriff's department, the police department, come in and raid their homes, steal their evidence, steal their stuff, and foreclose on their home. The people want it. That's what the man clearly stated. So that's the point that I'm getting to. Or Well, actually, he's not a man. He's claiming he's not a man anymore. He's a, a female. He went from Bill Hall to Claire Hall. No disrespect, Bill. We know, you know. But see, the point being is going through this structure, stepping out of the movie, watch the production, how this stuff works. And if you don't comprehend the legal system at this point, at least watch the movie Interstate, uh, Interstate 60, you know, and we'll get some other links with other movies on the website. But we don't want to get we can put their names up there, but we don't want to put them up because we do want to do not want to get in any copyright violations. So we got to stay clear of that. So anyhow, I would like to say thank you. We appreciate everybody's attendance tonight, and may the Creator look over you, may Mother Earth feed you, and Father bring up your children. Have a good one. All right. Thank you for listening to Disclaimers by Ed Johnson. It is Saturday, twenty uh, April twenty fifth, twenty twenty, and see you next Saturday.